Okay, so our recording is started for anyone that is a, a concerned about being on a live webinar. Um, I just have to notify you that this webinar is being recorded. So if you would not like to be on a live webinar, you can sign off. Um, it's really our, our panelists that will be on video and be able to speak. All the attendees are muted and your videos are not on. So I don't think um, you have anything to be concerned about, but it's an important thing that I need to make sure you all are aware of. So again, I would like to welcome you all to our webinar on using biologicals to manage leafy greens and brassica crops. Um, this is a two hour webinar and it does have two hours of DPR credits. Uh, so if you are, are joining the webinar to receive credits, it's very important that you are on the webinar the entire time that you logged in under the name that your PCA license number is associated with and that you complete the quiz that we will send you after the webinar. You need to have a 70% pass rate for the quiz. If you don't pass, I'll notify you and I'll give you the option to retake it if you would like, okay? Please make sure you keep the course ID um, on record and I will be following up in an email with a copy of this presentation in PDF form with a, with a recording of the webinar and please just keep all those things on file. So if you ever are um, audited by DPR, you have uh, the information that you need, okay? Um, I'd also like to remind you to use the chat if you have any technical concerns or questions throughout the webinar. We will be having two sections of the webinar that are Q&A sections at the end of the product section, and then at the end of the laws and regulate, regulations section. For your questions, please use the Q&A feature. At the, it's usually at the bottom of your screen. So Q&A is what you wanna punch uh, or click on, excuse me, to ask a question. Um, the chat is really for corresponding with, question, or with um, technical difficulties or chiming in to let us know where you're coming from. So I just wanna share, oh, we have Uruguay, South America, welcome. We have some California, Salinas, California, uh, San Juan, Capistrano, California. I don't even know where that is. Um, there, I'm going to have to Google that one. My mic is glitching. Okay. Is it, is it okay now? Trinidad. I think I need to upgrade. My, I think my cord is going. Colorado, Michigan. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us this morning. I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speakers and we will get started. So please, if you have any problems hearing us or viewing the screen, let us know in the chat. Our first speaker is Brian Guest. And Brian um, brings a wealth of experience in organic and conventional growing operations to MBI, having spent over 13 years in all aspects of growing across multiple firms. Most, re most recently, Guest was the Director of Field Operations for Live Organic Produce, where he oversaw all areas of field operations, including the food safety program and vendor compliance systems. Prior to this role, he managed regional grower operations in Southern California for homegrown organic farms, leading all aspects of in-house farm management to ensure the highest dollar per acre return was achieved. Additionally, guests held roles of increasing responsibility with growers such as Beloian Farms in Fresno, California, and manufacturers such as Helena Chemical. In this role at MBI, uh, Brian is our territory sales manager for the Southwest region. He covers Arizona, Colorado, Texas, uh, Nebraska, New Mexico, and Southern California. So if you're in those areas, please make sure to, to message Brian and just say hello. It's always great for Brian to be able to connect with people in those areas. So in his role at MBI, he focuses on expanding MBI's presence in the Southwest Territory by building awareness and partnering with both organic and conventional growers and distributors to provide insights and assistance with using biologicals and plant health products in an integrated pest management system. So Guess has a Bachelor of Science degree with an emphasis in agriculture business, agricultural business from California State University, Fresno. So Brian, thank you for being one of our speakers this morning. I know um, we're gonna get a wealth of information from you and I appreciate it. 
Our second speaker is Dr. Melissa O'Neill. She has served in her current role with Marone Bioinnovations as the Senior Product Development Manager for the Southwestern United States since June 2014. Prior to that time, she worked as a PCA and a CCA with Boom Booth branches and was formerly an employee with Dr. Beth Grafton Cardwell's Citrus Entomology Laboratory jointly stationed at the Linco Kearney Agriculture Research and Extension Centers. Melissa holds an AA and AS degree from the College of the Sequoias, a BS in biology from Fresno State, and a Master of Science in Agriculture from Cal Poly San, San Luis Obispo, and a Doctorate of Education from California State University, Fresno. Melissa's current research interests include entomology, plant pathology, plant health, and wheat science, she is also involved with investigations centered on issues affecting women in science, technology, mathematics, and engineering, so STEM disciplines, and the importance of STEM education in overall student success. So Melissa is definitely an expert in her field, and we are very grateful that she's on the Marone Bio team, and um, she is going to add uh, some very valuable information on our field trial results for today's webinar. So Melissa, thank you so much for being a speaker today. And then lastly, we have David Gomez. He is an agriculture worker safety training um, uh, personnel at Gar Bennett. So David grew up in Sanger, California, where agriculture was a way of life. His parents were field workers and it was through them where he developed a passion for agriculture and all it stood for. As a teen and in his early 20s, David began harvesting grapes, driving tractor and applying pesticides. While working in the fields, he also attended West Hills College in Lemoore, where he planned to major in agriculture engineering. Unfortunately, his co college experience was, shut, uh, was cut short uh, because he needed to help his family out full uh, financially, so he, he started a full-time job. And his work experience has included working in packing houses and on farming operations. So he's gained hands-on experience and has learned a lot about worker safety. David has been with Gar Bennett as a worker safety trainer for two years and absolutely loves it. And I know we're all going to be very appreciative for his information that he'll be sharing at the end. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Brian Guess who is going to cover our safe har harbor uh, statement and then get right into the products we're going to talk about today. So Brian, take it away. Excellent, thank you, Angela. I appreciate the introduction. And Marone Bio is a publicly traded company. So this is our safe harbor statement. I am a vested shareholder with Marone Bio and any forward looking statements, um, this document covers that. Next slide, please. So for today's agenda, we're going to brief interview of Marone Bio, then we're going to touch base on some of our biofungicides and their fit into the leafy greens market, followed by some field data from Dr. O'Neill. Then I'll be jumping over to our bio insecticide products and their fit into leafy greens, followed by some more field data by Dr. Melissa O'Neill. We'll do a quick little summary of the three products that we're going to be talking about today, a Q&A session, and then Mr. Gomez is going to be talking about laws and regs from Gar Bennett. Okay, a little bit Marone Bio. We were founded in 2006 by Dr. Pamela Marone, Dr. Mar or Dr. Pam, or uh, Pam as we call her, Dr. Marone, is um, she's dedicated her life to uh, discovering and commercializing biological pesticides. And just recently, she turned over the reins to Kevin Helash. He is our new CEO of Marone Bio. And in 2013, we had an IPO and went public. Our headquarters is in Davis, California, where we have our offices and our main research and development facility with the greenhouse. And I encourage you, if you are in the Davis or Sacramento area, let me uh, shoot me an email or a phone call or your territory sales rep, and we'd be more than willing to align, to set up a um, lab tour. It's a, I, I highly recommend if you're in the area to go on the tour, you'll be impressed with the research and development facility that we've created and the, the tools and what our scientists are doing in there. And then jumping over, our manufacturing is in Bangor, Michigan, and uh, we have a nationwide sales and technical support with global distribution, roughly 450 patents worldwide, and we've researched about 18,000 microorganisms and have them in our database. And the next slide, these are the microorganisms that we have commercialized here in the United States. This is our current product portfolio. And as you look over this portfolio, you can see we have 
fungicides, insecticides, nematicides, and also two plant health products, Pace Setter and Haven. And we have some more plant health products coming down our pipeline in the years to come. And next slide, please. And so for today's presentation, we're gonna be focusing on these three products. Two fungicides, Stargus, which is our biological certified organic bacillus fungicide targeting downy mildew, and Jet Ag is our parasitic acid product that we are targeting in the, the parasitic acid marketplace. Jumping over to insecticides, Venerate XC is our heat killed dead Burkholderia bacteria that is a certified organic biological insecticide. So biopesticides, biorationals, um, biofertilizers, biostimulants, there's a lot of bios out there. And I really try to bring some order to this chaotic environment and focusing just on these biopesticide categories, which we are manufacturers of, I've broken it into two subcategories. The first subcategory being biopesticides that are microbial based. And so these microbials, they can be a fungi, a bacteria, virus, or protozoa. They can be either living or dead. An example of a dead bacteria bio insecticide is our venerate. An example of a living bacteria is Stargus. And you can see um, there's also other EPA registered uh, biofungicides in this category. And then the next subcategory is biochemicals. These would be plant extracts, pheromones, soaps, and fatty acids. An example of an EPA registered product in this category would be regalia. Also your, your neem oils, um, your soaps are also under this biochemical category. So we're going to focus, Stargus is our bacillus-based biofungicide. And the next slide is, what is Stargus? So Stargus is a liquid product. We have a one to four quarts per acre is the rate that we have on, uh, on Stargus. And it's a bacillus amylicocaphaceous strain 727 is our, um, is our specific strain. Some of the kind of key features I like to point out, it is OMRI listed. There on the bottom of the slide, you can see we have we are MRL exempt. A zero day pre-harvest interval, minimal PPE is required for this fungicide, and it's a four hour REI for worker reentry intervals. And Stargus, it's a broad spectrum product. It contains peptides produced during the fermentation process, and that's what's providing the fungicidal activity. It's a multiple modes of action. Multiple modes of action. It's this ISR, SAR. Uh, systemic required resistance that it's triggering within the plant cell and then also the lipopeptides within the fermentation process. We have, we are pursuing the changing of the name, the subclassification. So instead of amylicocaphaceous strain F727, it will be called Bacillus nocomori F727. As we become more proficient in our screening and identifying these bacillus species, we're able to reclassify them before you look five, six years ago in this bacillus market, a lot of it was the bacillus amylicocaphaceus, and now we've been able to really isolate, okay, what is the specific strain? And so this is a Nakamori F727 strain. And I have another slide that later in the presentation that will show why it's so important to really know what strain of bacillus you're using, and it's their screen for specific plant pathogens that you're targeting. Okay, and moving on to the next slide. This is Stargus itself. It's a liquid formulation, car caramelly looking. It has a two year shelf life, no special storage requirements. A lot of living products you do, you have to require, they require certain temperature regulations, but Stargus is um, it's a hardier strain of bacillus. So no storage, no special storage requirements. Picture in the very center is Stargus mixing and staying suspended while in solution. If you take your eyes over to the right two pictures, that is Stargus colonizing in a peach tree dish. So this is what's happening on the leaf surface or in the root zone. And the next slide has a peach tree dish oh, on the bottom corner. We can go back. Perfect. So if you see there, so on the top is the bacil is the Stargus colonizing, and the bottom is the botrytis colony. And these lipopeptides in Stargus is what inhibits that growth. And you can see a very distinct line where the betrays will it stops growing and this is what's happening there after stargus is applicated and we can move on so here we have I, I like to show all the different bacillus products that are on the marketplace so you can see 
I really try to hit home the species is extremely important. You can, you can see our stars at the very top, Bacillus nakamurai, F727. And then we have double nickel, also Bacillus analytica cafaceus, D747, Sonata, Bacillus pumilus, Serenade and Cease, both the same product. Those are now a Bacillus renamed analytica cafaceus 713. Those are kind of the three, four or five Bacilluses on the marketplace and really understanding the strain of Bacillus and what they're specifically targeting. With our Stargus, it would be downy mildew is where we're positioning it and we see the best activity on the leafy greens. We can move on to the next slide. Here is a spectrometer graph of Stargus and you can see the peaks and valleys. And then we also have product A and product B. These are two other Bacillus products pulled from the previous slide. We're not able to dis disclose which uh, products they are, but you can see there is a difference from strains. We're not sure what the peaks and valleys correlate to, but the more peaks you have, the hypothesis is the more activity you have. And you can see there is a difference with Stargus. We have more activity. So modes of action. So if you take your eyes to the bottom right side of the corner, we have a FRAC code from the Fungicide Action Resistant Committee. BM02 is our classification. This BM02 category was just created by the FRAC committee, I think this year, and you'll see the bacilluses in this, in this space and a couple other biologicals, but it's biologicals with multiple modes of action is the name of BMO2. And going along with that, we have three modes of action for Stargus, two primary and one secondary. One of the primary ones are these active molecules called peptides. These are produced during the fermentation process. They attack spores, they attack the spore germination process, specifically germ tube extension parts on the pathogen. And somewhat like a contact kill mode of action is our primary. One of our, our second mode of action is that induced systemic resistance, ISR. It's boosting the immune system and the ability of the plant to defend off of the pathogen infection. And then we have a third mode of action. It's a minor leaf and root colonization. Bacillus originates from the soil, so we see more colonization in the soil substrate than on the leaf surface. And the next slide, please. So if you're looking, if you haven't used Stargus before, these are, this is kind of the art of use that we're using it out in the field. In uh, California, we only have a foliar ground and foliar air label. Or the rest of the United States, you can do a chemigation or soil application. Uh, just focusing on that foliar ground, we recommend one to four quarts an acre, about 25 to 50 gallons per acre spray, vo spray volume. And you want to repeat this treatment seven at a seven to 10 day interval. Every region, I cover the Yuma area, we have a different protocol down there. Uh, reach out to Taylor Hoover there on the Central Coast or Doug, Doug out there in the Central Valley. And each region is going to have its own little nuances and its own kind of yeah, I'd say intricacies of how to use Stargus into the program. And so foliar, um, in the state of California, we have uh, two to four quarts an acre. And everywhere else out of the US, you can do 0.5 to four quarts an acre on your application. And also very similar, five gallons per acre spray volume, and then a seven to day interval is what we recommended. Moving over to the soil application, um, I've been using, I've been putting this through the sprinklers, uh, pre-plant, or at post-plant after a parasitic acid uh, treatment of the field, been seeing some pretty good preliminary results, but we recommend three to four quarts an acre chemigated on minimum five gallon per acre spray volume and repeated at a 10 to 21, 10 to 21 day interval if you're gonna be going with that chemigation. But once again, there's a lot of nuances within the region. So really reach out to your uh, territory sales rep and we can work through you, work through the program with you and how to position it correctly in the field so we're targeting the correct pathogen. And next slide, please. So a quick little recap of Stargus, the product benefits, art of use, and active ingredients. So product benefits, it's a broad spectrum control for downy mildew, Botrytis physerium. So if you're uh, Botrytis physerium pythium, some of those soil-borne pathogens, doing a chemigation treatment is highly effective, uh, multiple modes of action. And then on the art of use, It's a liquid foliar chemigation or soil treatment. You can uh, use it in your backpack or hand sprayer for some of the smaller operations and apply two to four times at a seven to 10 day interval is what we recommend. You see on a lot of these um, biological products that seven to 10 day interval is a sweet spot. 
on them. And the active ingredient is the Bacillus amylicococcaceous strain F727. Okay, moving on to Jet Ag. Jet Ag is our parasitic acid product. And the next slide should tell us a little more about it. So what is Jet Ag? Jet Ag is certified organic, OMRI listed, MRL exempt, zero day pre-harvest interval, and a four hour REI. It's a broad spectrum fungicide, bactericide, and allergicide for agricultural use. Uh, controls foliar and soil borne diseases. It's a uh, active ingredient, it's parasitic acid, otherwise known as PAA and hydrogen peroxide. Its mode of action, it oxidizes the pathogen cells, exploding those cells and killing it on contact. And then it's compatible with most crop protection materials. Really reach out to your local rep. And if you're thinking of tank mixing, uh, jet ag with uh, some other insecticides or fungicides. Get that pre-approval of the approved chemicals that are on there. Um, there's certain metals that oxidate. There's a oxidation heat, a, ther a thermal oxidation reaction. So reach out to us and we can really tailor that program one-on-one -on -one and make sure we're using this product correctly in those tank mixes. And then no pathogen resistance because it is a contact kill. And then another key I like to leave, like to point out, it leaves no resistance residual. On another slide, we'll walk through what it breaks down, but if you're looking for that true organic product, Jet Ag is, um, is that product for you. And then what is Jet Ag? I think there might be a couple more bullet points on this slide. There we go. Okay, parasitic acid, also known, or per, peroxyacetic acid, also known as parasitic acid. Two words for the same meaning. Uh, is a PA. It's an organic peroxide based colorless liquid with a low pH and a strong vinegar, vinegar like odor. It's industrial vinegar, is like what we like to say it. And the acid in that vinegar solution is what is offering that uh, oxidation. Uh, equilibrium mixture contains hydrogen peroxide plus acetic acid, acid and vinegar. So we, it's a batch blending. So we take industrial vinegar and mix it in with hydrogen peroxide and water with some other catalysts to stabilize the reaction. Then we have a little chemical reaction on the bottom of this slide, it should pop up. There you go. So you have the far left uh, chemical chain, you have the hydrogen peroxide plus peroxyacetic acid. And I, th I think that CH3, CO2, CO3H, I think that's parasitic acid, I'm not sure, but there's an equilibrium um, when it isn't solution. So over to the modes of action of star of uh, jet ag. The primary mode of action is oxidation. The PAA disinfects by oxidizing the outer cell membranes of vegetative bacterial cells, endospores, yeast, and mold spores. So you can use this as a foliar fungicide, water treatment, or as a soil application, oxidizing all those pathogen cells. Do take note, it does not discriminate against good bacteria and bad bacteria. So if you are having a living mycorrhizae colony or um, trichoderma, it will also kill those good bacteria in the soil. So what I like to do is I go through, I view, star, I view jet ag or any parasitic acid product as that wipe, wipes the slate clean, kills everything in the soil or on the leaf surface, and then you want to come back and apply your beneficial microbes once again to recolonize that soil. Um, the mechanism of oxidation is the transfer of electrons. Therefore, the stronger the oxidizer, the faster the electrons are transferred to the microorganism, and the faster the microorganism is inactivated or killed. So it really comes down to concentration. You look, when you do work with us individually on creating an application program, you'll see it's all based off of this parasitic acid dilution ratio to offer those electron transfers. And then this is the oxidizer chart, the electron volts, and you can see parasitic acid at 1.81. Then the next comparable product is chlorine dioxide, 1.57 electron volts. Sodium hypochlorite, I believe that's bleach, 1.36 electron volts. And then you have hydrogen peroxide, which is the second ingredient in jet ag, and that's at 1.3. We see parasitic acid is doing the heavy lifting in this formulation, and you get some secondary activity from hydrogen peroxide. Yeah, next slide, please. Jet Ag, how are you going to use Jet Ag in your uh, leafy green operation? So first of all, soil treatment, highly effective. 
we like to say controls slash suppresses soil-borne plant pathogens such as Pythium, Phytophthora, Rhizoctonia, Physerium, and Verticillium. The reason we like to have suppress, as I've learned more about how deep these plant path these soil pathogens go, this Pythium, Rhizoctonia, it can extend, I think, anywhere from three to four feet, even further down into that substrate. And so I really try to sterilize that first, that I'd say like four or five inches, maybe maybe foot down of growing medium, where we want to sterilize that. That's where those the plant root or the leaf, the roots of the leafy greens are going to be growing. And so that's what we want to kill. We're not going to be able to sterilize all the phytophthora out of the soil just because we're not really sure how deep it goes. Second way of using jet ag, foliar. It can be used as a fungicide, bactericide treatment for controlling or suppress it, suppression for many growing crops, including leafy greens. So as your typical fungicide spray, it can either be tank mixed in or you can add tank mix partner in with an insecticide and get a double shot um, by using jet ag in there. And then irrigation water treatment, such as um, your non-potable waters in the last 20 to 30 days of irrigating your leafy greens need to be treated. And that's where jet ag can be positioned also in your spray tanks. If you're using non-potable water for your spray tanks, you can put a small amount of jet ag in there to sterilize and be compliant with the Leafy Green Commission. Okay, so the three, three areas that you would be using jet ag on your farm, your foliar application, this would be a fungicide spray, and that a curative rate would be two to four quarts an acre. The second area that you could use jet ag on your operation would be the soil application, and that'd be one to three gallons per acre. Through chemigation, I really like um, uh, the, the pre-plant, I've used it as a pre-plant um, chemigation treatment through the spring cores. It's pretty effective in cleaning up the physarium and phytophthora in there. And then you can also use it mid to late season too. And then the third area of use would be water treatment. And in water treatment, I've broken down into two subcategories, your spray, spray, tank, spray tank sanitization at a half an ounce per gallon, or your irrigation water to be compliant with the Leafy Green Commission that'd be 4.3 ounces to five ounces per thousand gallons. And once again, really reach out to your local rep. We wanna help you use this product correctly, be effective and position it correctly. And we can really tailor those um, uh, ranch specific programs on what we're targeting. Okay, and this is another key point of parasitic acid and jet ag. It, it bio, parasitic acid is rapidly biodegradable. And if you can, we'll just throw them all in there. It breaks down into oxygen, acetic acid, and water after it, after you spray it in the field. So it oxidizes the organic compounds, and then it breaks down oxygen, as, acetic acid, which is vinegar, and water. So talk about being a true organic uh, fungicide or a true organic pesticide. And the next slide, please. Just some of the uh, key review of jet ag product benefits broad spectrum bactericide and fungicide, uh, excellent tank mix partner for going after downy mildew, highly stable and compatible, foliar, chemigation, soil, irrigation, and water treatment is all on the label. And our mixture of parasitic acid is at 4.9%. Hydrogen peroxide is at 26.5. So when you're making your calculations on your concentration ratios, we're gonna be going off that 4.9% of parasitic acid because that is the product that is doing the heavy lifting. We've combined all the uses, uh, such as foliar chemigation, soil irrigation, all onto one label for your convenience. And I think now we have a slide. Angela, if you wanna take over. Yes, so thank you so much, Brian. We're going to transition over to Melissa O'Neill, who's going to go through some field data. But before we do that, we want to appreciate you for joining this webinar. And our appreciation is we're, we're gonna be sharing uh, with two lucky winners, uh, one of these gifts. So we have uh, a lens clip, and then we have a drone uh, that we're going to be uh, giving away. We're gonna ask one question right now. So everybody get ready. I'm giving you a, just a second to um, get on your phones or, or whatever you're doing and be ready to type it into the chat. Okay, the first person to answer correctly will um, get to uh, pick which gift you'd like. Um, so with that, here we go, drum roll please. I'm gonna ask the question in five seconds. <laughs> the first person to respond uh, correctly will be our winner. So the question is, 
what leafy green does Popeye eat to gain strength? Real tough question here. So again, what leafy green does Popeye eat to gain strength? So, oh, look at the chat go. <laughs> All right, so our uh, my colleague Nick is gonna go ahead and um, let, let you know who the winner is, um, but stay tuned. We're gonna have another giveaway um, when we transition over to David Gomez from Gar Bennett in a little bit. So again, thanks for being on the webinar and thanks for staying engaged. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and ask Melissa O'Neill, Dr. Melissa O'Neill to take it over. Thank you so much, Angela, and good day to everyone on the webinar. Good luck on winning the swag. I know that's a lot of answers very quickly, so we'll see who the lucky winner is. From my piece, I'd like to discuss a bit more about Stargus and particularly focusing on the field research and demonstration studies. So we'll get right into that following the great introduction that Brian Guest gave us to the product. This first slide, I'd like to do a bit of orientation first because the next several slides will cover a number of studies we've been involved with. And I'd like to direct your eye to the lower right hand side of the screen where you see a treatment timing table. Here we're showing treatment timings for three different studies, which we'll consider data for in the next several slides. As you might notice on the right, excuse me, the left hand column of this table, there are three different sites, 19032 MJO, 33 MJO, and 34 MJO. How do these differ? Well, basically they were done during different times of the growing season during 2019 in the Salinas Valley. 19034 was the earliest study. You might see it was in May, followed by 19032, which was during the middle of summer, July, August. And then finally 19033, which was done late season during September, October. All of these were performed in different sites, but all in Salinas. So let's dig in and then look at some of these data which were applied to the Romaine variety Carneros. For our first slide, we'll consider the percentage severity on the y-axis. And here we have double nickel at two pounds per acre applied four times. And as you recall, there were those treatment timing tables in the beginning, those were the four treatment dates. And to your right, Stargus two quarts per acre at the same treatment timings. What we saw here was a reduction of 15% in terms of percentage severity of downy mildew with the Stargus treatment with the same treatment timings. The next slide, we will consider the yield in pounds per acre for that same exact study that we just saw severity for. Here, of course, the same entries, double nickel two pounds per acre and Stargus two quarts per acre. For the Stargus treatment, we saw 6% higher yield compared to what we saw for the harvest in the double nickel treatment. And overall, that was about 78,000 pounds per acre for the Stargus treatment. So we'll move now to the second study of that group of three. Here we have a bit of a different slide, so more orientation going on. The percentage severity on the y-axis, but we have two different sets of bars. To the left hand side of the slide is the data that were collected on 10919. And to the right hand side, the three bars represent data collected a bit later on 1017 2019. There are three treatments here that we'll be considering. The gold is double nickel, two pounds per acre, four treatment timings. The gray, Sonata, three quarts per acre, and Stargus, two quarts per acre. All of these were applied on the same dates. And this was the late study of the three we saw in the first slide, as you might know by the fact that it's in October in Salinas. So across both sampling dates, either 10-9 or 10-17-19, we saw higher percentage severity of downy mildew in either double nickel or sonata, which are the gold and the gray bars on the left right side of the slide, versus Stargus, which is in the blue lower on both sampling dates for Stargus 10.9 and 10.17, showing a reduction of that downy mildew severity. I'm seeing a question here and I'll answer right away. Vikram had asked if the differences are significant or numerically different. And I'd like to say that this was a large plot study in such that we didn't do replications for the particular study. So we can't attach statistical significance to the results. So we'll move on from there. 
And we have yield in pounds per acre for the study. Looking at double nickel, two pounds per acre applied four times, or Stargus, two quarts per acre on the right, four treatment timings again. Here we saw 214 greater pounds per acre return with the Stargus. So that was a great ending to that study on top of the reduction in disease. So for our percentage severity on the y-axis, looking at three different treatments here, the competitors double nickel had the highest percentage severity and Sonata kind of falling in the middle. When we're comparing the gold double nickel with the blue Stargus, we saw 9% less severity due to downy mildew with our Stargus. And when we're comparing Sonata with our Stargus, that was a 5% decrease with Stargus. So overall, Stargus coming out on top, helping to manage downy mildew. Moving to the next slide, we'll look at three different treatments in a different study. And note, this is on spinach. So we've talked about romaine lettuce till we're blue in the face, or, you know, it's actually very interesting, but we want to give spinach some love. So here we go. We're still considering the percentage severity due to downy mildew on the y-axis. The treatment timing tables in the lower right-hand side of the slide. We can see here that there were four treatments about a week apart, all applied during the month of October, 2019. And we have two sampling dates. So at the very bottom where the slide, uh, I'm sorry, where the bars are, we can see 11.5 will be in gold and 11.7 in the blue. Double nickel being the highest throughout in both sampling dates in terms of percentage severity of downy mildew. Shifting your eye to the middle of the slide, the serenade two quarts per acre, kind of just there comfortable middle. And then to the right hand side, Stargus two quarts per acre. It had lowest percentage severity on both sampling dates, as well as compared to both of the competitors in the study. And now we'll talk about the percentage incidence for the same study in spinach. So we don't need to go over the treatment timing table again, because it's the same as the prior study during October is when the study was conducted. We did have the two sampling dates there, the gold 11.5, the blue 11.7, 2019. We'll first look at double nickel over towards the left-hand side of the slide. Look like the highest percentage incidence on both sampling dates, comparatively speaking. Serenade, middle of the slide, and ironically falling in the middle in terms of the percentage incidence. And then shifting your eye to the right, Stargus two quarts per acre had the lowest percentage incidence on both sampling dates, giving it A, the lowest percentage severity on both sampling dates, and B, the lowest percentage of incidence on both sampling dates for this downy mildew study in spinach. Now a horse of a different color, although it's on the same crop, which is spinach. This is a study that we collaborated with Dr. Palumbo of the University of Arizona and Miller Chemical, who produces the surfactant New Film P. And really, we were looking at the safety of Stargus on spinach. Also, they were looking at the safety of the surfactant clearly, but many people who might be familiar with the crop spinach will be aware that it's a very sensitive crop. And if phytotoxicity, AKA damage to plants as a result of applying agricultural chemicals is going to be seen, then it is darn sure going to be seen on a spinach crop. So this is a rather large table and I'll just do a bit of orientation to start with the bullet points at the lower center of the table. There were three applications made on week intervals, starting in February and ending in mid-March. And there were two phytotoxicity or plant damage evaluations made, and those happened on February 28th and March 13th. Finally, the rating of one means no observable damage, so zero phytotoxicity with a rating of one. Looking at the table itself, we'll just start over on the left-hand side. You can see the treatment column, which is the very first column in the table. There are several treatments included, a water treatment, Entrust, Pyganic, and Stargus, which is on the bottom. The rates per acre come in the next column. You know, there were some treatments, for instance, the first row in the table, water was applied alone. Then it was applied with new film P at a couple of rates. Entrust alone, Entrust with new film P at four ounces, Pyganic alone, as well as new film with Pyganic. 
And then finally in the bottom, we looked at Stargus alone and Stargus four ounces of, of new film P added. Now shift your eye to the right-hand side of the table. The phytotoxicity rating are the final three columns in the table. And it was done at two leaf, four leaf, and six to eight leaf stage. Now zero phytotoxicity was seen. The one rating, 1.0 ratings in the table mean that there were no observations of phytotoxicity whatsoever for any of the treatments, water alone, or adding uh, new film to Stargus, Pyganic, or Entrust. So that's wordy, very, very wordy. And sometimes I think pictures are worth a thousand words. So why don't we move on to the next slide and just see what that looked like. Here we have Stargus on our left-hand photo added to new film P. On the right-hand photo, it's the water plus new film P, which essentially is acting as a control in the study. A control meaning that it's untreated or that we're just looking at water. So this is excellent to see that we didn't have any negative effects with Stargus, adding to that surfactant. Um, the water looks the same as what we did in Stargus. Very good news there for Stargus, it's safe on spinach. I'd like to talk just for a moment about sclerotinia, and in this case on the Romaine varietal Carneros. Sclerotinia minor and sclerotiorum were pr present in this study, which was done in Salinas during 2019. Tough diseases, as many of you working in the leafy greens and cool crops may know, the treatment timing tables in the lower right-hand side of the slide, and there were four treatments starting in May 9th and going all the way through May, about week-long intervals until the final day of May. Percentage incidence on the y-axis, we have double nickel in here and Sonata in the middle, as well as Stargus on the right-hand on the right-hand side, excuse me. And for Stargus, we saw the lowest incidence of sclerotinia due to both sclerotiorum and minor species. We'll consider also the percentage severity from the same exact study we were just discussing. And we saw a bit of rearrangement of the bars, uh, double nickel a bit higher here. And if you notice, that's about 80% severity. So it was a hot field in terms of effect of sclerotinia. Sonata falling in the middle in terms of percentage severity and Stargus lowest severity. So for both incidence and severity, Stargus came out on top for the sclerotinia study that involved both species of sclerotinia most commonly dealt with in our field. Here we have a new concept I'd like to introduce. You might notice that BioUnite logo hovering over the rightmost bar in the chart. BioUnite is a concept of Marone Bioinnovations, which is essentially adding chemistry to biologicals and looking for synergistic or additive effects when we add those products together. So in this study, it's exactly what we did. We looked at a BioUnite program. A bit of orientation on the slide to start with, we'll see our treatment timing table in its usual location, lower right. There were four treatments in the study, which was conducted in Yuma, there were uh, starting on January 7th, right, and early during the year and ending up in mid-February there, percentage of incidence on the y-axis. The untreated control here had about 85, a little more than 85% incidence of downy mildew. Ritamol gold, that was at 0 0.25 pints per acre, applied four times, brought that down quite nicely. But what I'd like to point out specifically with this BioUnite concept is we added Stargus two quarts per acre to an even lower rate of Ritamol gold than was tested alone. Note that the BioUnite program has Ritamol gold at 0 0.187 pints per acre versus the Ritamol, which you'll see one bar over to the left, which is at 0 0.25 pints per acre. So adding those two uh, um, products together, basically, BioUnite program, we saw a lower percentage incidence of downy mildew on lettuce compared to what we saw in Ritamil alone at a higher rate, as well as both are clearly outcompeting what we saw in the untreated control. So with that, we'll look at another slide. Uh, let's go back one slide. 
because we'd like to look at the yield in pounds per acre for that same BioUnite study that we were just discussing pest pressure on. Here we do have the same inclusions, untreated, ritamol gold at the point, 0 0.25 pounds per acre, as well as that BioUnite program that we went through before with the reduced rate of ritamol gold. And we saw a very nice boost in yield with that BioUnite program adding Stargus and ritamol gold, which had about $1,700 additional revenue with the ROI assumptions that are listed in the lower left-hand side of the graph. So with that, I think we'll turn it back over to Brian Guest because we're going to be shifting into our bioinsecticide portion of the webinar now. Thank you. Excellent, thank you, Melissa. And we see all your questions there. I was just typing one to Jesse. We will make sure if we don't answer them in the chat right now, we will reach out one-on-one -on -one to you and make sure we get an answer to all those questions. Okay, moving on over to Venerate. Venerate is our heat-killed Burkle Calderia um, bioinsecticide, recommended rates one to four quarts per acre. Sweet spot is at two to three quarts per acre is where I, I like to use it. Active ingredient, Burkle Calderia reingensis. This is a heat-killed dead bacteria. That dead bacteria is key. We are tank mix compatible with just about every other insecticide. I go out a lot with Entrust and Pyganic pH. We are not sensitive, so you can go on either sides of the spectrum. And then the next bullet points uh, controls foliar feeding pests, soft body insects, and piercing and sucking insects. And we'll talk through the modes of action and why we can cover all these, um, these insects. And it's a IGR, like mode of action, enzymatic degradation of exoskeleton structures and interferes with molting and gut disruption. Our IRAC insecticide resistant action committee, where code is still pending, uh, very similar to that FRAC code on our insect on our fungicides um, application foliar and chemigation. Some just quick details on the bottom: OMRI listed, MRL exempt, zero day pre harvest interval, minimal uh, PPE, and four hour reentry. And this is where I position uh, Venerate in the leafy green operations: aphids, mites, thrips. Those are key target insects. And then when you're looking down the lepidopterans, corn earworm and fall army worm are the, um, the worms, the lepidopterans that I target this with, and we can compete against BTs. I really want to push you guys when you're out there, when you're doing your IPM scouting in the fields, let's really identify those worms and moss, and then let's pick the correct BT or uh, venerate in this case for those species. You get some secondary activity on lycus, mealybug, leafhopper, and whitefly, and there's also more um, insects on the label. Modes of action for venerate, active ingredient, non-viable Burkle Calderia reingensis. This is heat killed during the fermentation, after the fermentation process, making it tank mix compatible with your other insecticides. First mode of action, exoskeleton degradation, active against adults and nymphs. Second one, molting interference, exposed nymphs and immatures are unable to molt. And then ingestion, so those chewing, sucking, piercing insects, that's where um, venerate is going to have its activity on. And then here is, I believe this is a corn earworm, and you can see the venerate treated, untreated control, and that exoskeleton degradation. It's an IGR-like symptoms of uh, the synapsis of the external uh, worm. And then next slide, please. So venerate XC, the art of use, foliar application, uh, one, to four, one to four quarts per acre, tank mix friendly, compatible with adjutants. We recommend a non-ionic surfant surfactant spreader sticker avoid acidifiers, and our pH, we recommend anywhere from six to eight uh, gamma pH in there. And then some key features about Venerate, uh, MRL exempt, four hour REI, zero day pre-harvest interval, IRAC code pending, art of use, one to four quarts per acre, tank mix friendly. We have a foliar, chemigation, and backpack verbiage on the label, and the active ingredient, non-viable Burkle Calderia reingensis. So it's a dead bacteria. And then off to Melissa for some PD data. Thank you so much, Brian. Really appreciate that background information on the product. We'll get right into the data in an effort of timeliness. So we're looking here at Venerate XC plus or rotated with Entrust in this case, also a BioUnite program of a sort. Orientation for the slide, lower right-hand corner, we can see there were three treatment timings all during March. The number of thrips larvae or immature thrips per plant are on the y-axis. 
Untreated control there up around four and in trust bringing that down around two immatures per plant. But looking at the rotation of venerate, two quarts per acre at the first and third timings, rotated with entrust at a reduced rate you might notice, which is six ounces per acre at the B timing, brought down the number of thrips per plant below putting entrust on alone at 10 ounces per acre. We'll move to the next slide where we will consider the number of adult thrips per plant for the same study. And numbers of adults were about 2.25 and untreated control for each plant. Entrust here being a little bit higher, same thing, 10 ounces per acre of entrust at the AC timings, shifting your eye to the red bar, that's the Venerate Entrust program here. And we saw uh, improved control using that rotation, even with the lower rate of entrust at the B timing. So with our adults, we saw reduction the most with the Venerate Entrust program. On our next slide, we'll look at a different study. We're going to look at the number of thrips per plant in total, which is on the y-axis. You might notice at the bottom, we have number of larvae or immature thrips, whatever you like to call them in gray, and the number of adults in red. So what we're observing here in this slide is that the number of immatures in gray was reduced with all of the programs, well, either in trust or venerate, but in trust rotated with venerate had the lowest number of immature thrips in the gray bars. Both of course were out, out competing untreated control, but we like this rotation the best. Also with the adults, which are in red, adults were a bit lower overall throughout the study in the untreated control. However, the entrust brought them down that alone, but we saw it reduced quite a bit more when doing the, the BioUnite program with Venerate Entrust, which is a reduced rate of entrust at the three treatment timings along with two quarts per acre of Venerate. Now we'll talk a little bit about aphids. We're still working in lettuce in this case, the average number of aphids per head of lettuce on the y-axis. Our treatment timing table, lower right, we had five treatment timings all the way from early January to mid-February of this year. Our untreated control up around well, close to 10 aphids per head on average. And we looked at impede applied five times at a 2% rate brought it down a little bit when comparing to the untreated control, but the venerate two quarts per acre rate applied alone at those five treatment timings had 63% improved control overall, which is very good because this can be tough issue out in Yuma. So with the same study, so we won't discuss the treatment timings again since they're similar across the slides, the percentage of heads with over 10 aphids. So in this case, we're looking at just heavily infested heads. So in the untreated control, that was up near 45%, not very good when it comes to trying to market a crop of head lettuce. Impede over toward the right-hand side in the gray, brought that down to a little over 20% by itself, applied five times, but venerate with the same application schedule at two quarts per acre, had under 10% with heavily infested and gave improved control when comparing it to the competitor. Now we'll talk a little bit about the cruciferous crops with cabbage and looking at our old friend, green peach aphid. The number of green peach aphids per plant on the y-axis. Our treatment timing table in the lower right-hand corner of the slide we're looking at four treatment timings in this case from late February to late March. Untreated control here had about 30-ish, a little more than 30 aphids per plant. And we looked at PFR 97 at two pounds per acre in this case, compared with venerate three quarts per acre in this case, all applied four times. You might see that PFR 97 is just a hair lower than venerate, but we'll click once again and we'll see our cost comparison for this slide which is noteworthy in this case. While giving similar control, Venerate cost over $100 less per acre compared to PFR 97. So it is a good choice in this case. 
And with that, I'll turn it back over to Brian and thank you very much for your time. Excellent, thank you, Melissa. And we're just gonna get a quick little recap through the products. Stargus, our bacillus-based biofungicide, positioned for downy mildew and also some soil-borne botrytis fusarium and pythium diseases liquid formulation. Apply two to four times throughout your growing season at a seven to 10 day interval. And the active ingredient is the bacillus amelicocaphaceae strain F727. And strain is extremely important. Jet ag, broad spectrum bactericide, fungicide, uh, mode of action, um, oxidation. Heracetic acid concentration ratio 4.9. Hydrogen peroxide, we are at 26.5. Full year chemigation, soil um, verbiage is all on one label. And then our last product, Venerate, in wrapping up before you jump over to Q&A, is Venerate MRL exempt, four hour REI and zero day pre harvest interval. The IRAC code is still pending. Art of use, one to four quarts per acre. You can take mix it as you saw in Melissa's data with Entrust or with Pyganic, and you can do a full year chemigation application. And it is a dead bacteria, allowing us to be tank mix compatible with other uh, insecticides. And with that, this is our Marone Bio United States sales team. Please take down the rep that is in your territory, reach out to them, and we would love to help tailor you. We'd love to help um, tailor specific programs for your farm. Each region has its own little nuances, and um, we look forward to working with you. And then here is our MBI North American technical support. This presentation was intended for growers and PCAs, but if you are a university or academic, Please take down um, the PD individual within your territory. If you wanna do some field trials, you need uh, demo material on your ag extension facility, uh, the technical support team would be more than willing to help with you on your uh, research and development. And then this is our new QR code. So if you have your cell phones handy, open up your uh, photo app and you can scan that code. And just a reminder, JetAg, Stargus, and Venerate were the three products on today's webinar. With that, any other questions, feel free. I think we have a few minutes, Angela, I'll let you take over. Awesome, yes, thank you so much, Brian and Melissa. Um, we're gonna go ahead and open it up to Q&A. We're gonna take about five minutes for Q&A and then we'll get started with David Gomez from Gar Bennett, who will review the laws and regulations update. Um, first question is from Vikram. And it's uh, wondering if there's any Canadian PD trials that we might be able to share. Hi there, Vikram. Melissa O'Neill answering. We have done work in Canada. I can say specifically that comes to mind, we've worked with some hemp and cannabis studies, as well as some studies on crops like um, safflower and I believe sunflower and maybe some other crops of that type using Stargus because I worked with them on regulatory issues. We can share some of those data. Let's get your contact information and there may even be more studies. I don't necessarily do research in Canada, but my colleague Tim Johnson does and we can gather some information that might be of greatest interest to you if you can share your crops of interest. Thank you. Do we have any other questions for Brian or Melissa? If so, please type them in the Q&A section. Um, that allows us actually, when you view the recording, you can see uh, what, the question, what questions were asked. So uh, thanks, potato and horticulture crops, Vikram says, if you can see that, Melissa. I can see it and we'll note it and follow up with you soon. Excellent. Any other questions that we have? I know. I I saw a question, Angela. It was asking whether there had been, I can't find it at the moment, but whether there's yeah. been work done in uh, greenhouse settings using Stargus. And I know our research and development group has done work with the product in greenhouse settings, but I believe there's been some other work done as well. However, not in the territory that I manage. This may be another case where we would like to uh, write down your contact information and look through our data and follow up with you in terms of greenhouse studies on Stargus. And thank you for bringing that up. Excellent. Um, well, I'm going to give a last call for questions for Brian or Melissa. And while I do that, for those of you that are on the webinar, get ready to, to type in the chat. So make sure you go into the chat area for the swag giveaway. So remember the lovely slide with the um, foam clip or the the, um, the, uh, the drone. 
So we're going to give one more away today, and we're going to do it in just a few seconds. Um, before I ask the, the fun question for the giveaway, we have a serious question for our speakers, and that again is from Vikram. Um, any activity against wireworm, an emerging problem in many crops? Yes, Tim Johnson and other colleagues like Brian Mueller in the Midwest with our product development team have done work with this pest and there are some good supportive data with that and Vikram, we will go ahead and um, contact you with some of our commercial slides to share data here in the near future. And I just noticed while I'm speaking, it was Jorge Mendez that had asked about Stargus and Venerate in vegetables transplants in greenhouses. And that's in the chat. So Angela, if you can please note that for our follow-ups, we would like to share with Jorge uh, about these data for both Stargus and Venerate in vegetable transplants in greenhouses. You bet. Um, Nick, my colleague, I'm going to ask you, Nick, to just copy that and, and capture the name what, because I'm in a different window trying to monitor the, the Q&A. So yes, we'll definitely do that. Thanks. Yeah, I will, I'm going to save all the chat at the end for everyone. Awesome. Thank you. Because um, I've noticed the chat doesn't always capture in the recording, but the Q&A's do, I guess. Okay, we have another question for our speakers. So hold on tight if you're waiting for the swag question. <laughs> this is not it yet. Okay, Roel Rodriguez uh, asks, any activity on diamondback moths or brassica crops? Hello, Royal. Melissa O'Neill here. We've seen some suppression with diamondback moth, but we haven't had a large enough body of data, I believe, at this point, because we had some failed studies last year. I was really looking forward to those results. And unfortunately, um, failed studies happened largely because of COVID. So I hope to have a clearer answer to that by the end of this field season in Yuma. But for now, I'm going to cautiously say we've seen some suppression, but really not enough to draw a very steadfast conclusion in my scientific opinion. And thank you. Excellent. Another question for our speakers from Victor. Kindly asking more information on Grandivo trial, trials, such as the Venerate data shown. So um, I guess I can chime in first. Victor, we are going to have an organic webinar this afternoon where we will be cover covering um, Grandivo as a product and some of the, the field trials. If you're looking specifically for leafy trials or brassica trials, um, please um, clarify that in, in the Q&A and, &A, and um, we, can, we can follow up with that information if we have any. Melissa, do you have any um, insights to, sh to add? I think we'll need to follow up on it. Excellent. All right, get your fingers ready. <laughs> I'm going to ask the, the, the second and the final fun question for our swag drawing. And I'm gonna ask it in three, two, and one. Make sure you type in the chat. Okay, name your favorite ingredient to make a salad taste better. And with that, I'll let my colleague Nick follow up on the winners. And we're going to go ahead and transfer over to David from Gar Bennett, who is going to share some law and regulations updates. So David, take it away. Perfect. Thank you, Angela. And good afternoon to everybody. Um, I will be going over the PPE laws and regulations of um, my side of the presentation. Um, so for the first slide, um, for pesticide safety training, hazard communication, um, you do have to post a written hazard communication program, pesticide, uh, pesticide safety information series leaflets. Um, it does have to be read to all employees if requested in the familiar language. So if you do have any uh, Spanish speakers or um, et cetera, it does have to be provided in the language that they are familiar with. Um, you also have to maintain pesticide use records an essential location, which could be uh, your shop, it could be an office, but it does have to be accessible to all employees um, that may need it. And you do have to maintain safety data sheets for each pesticide uh, being used. So if you have a list of pesticides and you could create a binder uh, that contains all the safety data sheets that you guys have, um, it does have to be accessible also for all employees. Going on to the next slide, here's a uh, example of the Pesticide Safety Information Series leaflets, uh, also known as A8s. 
It does provide uh, pesticide safety, safety rules for pesticide handlers in agriculture settings. And it does have a little picture, a little image of a uh, pesticide applicator. So this targets all pesticide applicators. Um, it must also, be, this does have to be provided and um, posted at the central location. And it must be read in the employee's la language that they understand. Um, and it does provide a lot of information such as emergency medical care uh, information. So if you see on the left-hand side of this page, it does have the name, address, and telephone number uh, for any, uh, in case of any accidents or exposures, um, this has to be accessible for all employees in case there is an exposure. Um, now, if we could go back to that last slide, I have one more thing to explain. Um, on the right hand side, it does, it does have a box for all employers. So if you are an, a grower or an employer, um, this is a hazard communication series leaflets. Um, you do have to fill in the blanks. It does have to be filled out and it has to be displayed um, at your central location workplace. Um, and this leaflet must also be posted in all uh, permanent uh, destination decontamination facilities. So if you do have a decontamination area or a decon uh, station or anything like that, uh, this, this posting does have to be posted uh, because essentially if an accident were to happen and they do have to decontaminate their clothing or their PPE, uh, they do need access to this uh, paperwork here. So um, for the next slide, pesticide safety training, application specific information. Um, so as far as pesticide training goes, uh, the state and federal regulations require training before employees are allowed to handle pesticides. So um, any, any handler or any employee that will be handling pesticides does have to be trained prior to making an application or handling any type of pesticide. Um, you, you could start by deciding who can uh, train the employees. It could be a California certified commercial applicator, uh, California certified private applicators, uh, pest control advisors, UC extension advisors, um, or other certified people who, who uh, are knowledgeable in, in these types of things and, and being able to train. Um, and then if we go to the next slide, it, uh, it explains here, um, training the employees before handling any pesticides. So uh, who is a, a, a pesticide applicator? So it could be a mixer, it could be a loader, it could be an applicator, anybody transporting pesticides. Um, these are all considered handlers. And um, if you are a handler, you do have to be trained prior. Uh, once again, regardless if you're making an application, if you're mixing or loading, you do have to be trained prior to making an application or handling pesticides. Uh, train employees anytime a new pesticide uh, is being used. So for say you have never sprayed uh, Roundup and uh, you send an employee who has never been trained on Roundup, that specific employee who's making the application um, or your general employees, uh, do have to be trained prior to making that type of application. Um, and then train employees annually thereafter um, prior to your pesticide, um, prior to your pesticide training being expired, you do have to provide training uh, before it does expire. Going on to the next slide, pesticide handler training. Uh, you must have a written uh, training program and then uh, training for each pesticide or similar groups of pesticide must cover precautionary statements about human health hazards. Uh, the application responsibility to protect persons, animals, and property. So if you do have roadways, if you do have uh, houses or schools that are nearby, uh, you do have to provide information on how to be uh, protecting the, your surroundings if there's wildlife or anything, uh, dairies, cows, anything like that. You do have to protect your surroundings to avoid any accident um, to happen anywhere else other than, than your application uh, spot. Um, and then the need for appropriate use, removal and cleaning personal protective equipment. Uh, you do have, employers are, are required to provide personal protective equipment and do have to train on how to properly use uh, your personal protective equipment or the personal protective equipment that's required by the label um, and a proper use of, of or I'm sorry, uh, proper cleaning of personal protective equipment uh, in case if there is uh, contamination. And the safety procedures for handling, storing, transporting, and spill cleanup of the pesticides. So if there's uh, any spills, any cleanups that may have to be done, um, the, the proper uh, equipment does have to be provided by the employer 
and that uh, does have to be trained on prior to um, any handling um, of pesticides. And then hazards of pesticide for acute, chronic, or delayed effects. So acute being short-term and chronic effects uh, being long-term um, and delayed effects just being delayed uh, effects or symptoms caused by uh, any pesticide exposures. So if we go on to the next slide. Uh, pesticide handler training, training for each pesticide or similar group of pesticides must cover all possible routes by which the pesticide can enter the body, whether it's the skin, eyes, nose, or mouth. Um, and then signs of symptoms of an exposure does have to be explained also, which could be a headache, nausea, vomiting, irritated skin, burning eyes, uh, depending on what you guys are spraying and also where it lands on the body. Also routine de decontamination uh, procedures for employees do have to be created and explained prior to an application, cannot be done after because if an accident happens and you try to explain it after, of course, something may happen um, then. And then uh, information found on the product sa uh, safety data sheet. So safety data sheets do have to be explained and they do uh, have to be read to the employees uh, prior to making an application and they do have to be accessible for all employees also. Uh, first aid and emergency decontamination procedures. Um, emergency medical information does have to be uh, posted on all tractors and having uh, procedures in place in case of an accident, such as knowing exactly where your eyewash is or uh, extra PPE or your decontamination station, those types of procedures are a must uh, prior to making an application. Also, how to obtain uh, emergency medical care, uh, who and where to report. You can always report back to your central location where your A8s are posted, um, where, as I had explained, the orange papers that we recently just went over. Um, and yeah, th these, these emergency medical, this emer emergency medical information is mandatory depending on the county you are in, um, and it does have to be posted on the tractor uh, or any spray equipment that you will be using. And then prevention, recognition, and first aid for heat-related uh, illnesses. So talking about signs and symptoms of a heat-related uh, injury or illness, um, it does have to be explained and how to prevent them while using your personal protective equipment or using engineering controls such as an enclosed cap. Um, how to prevent these uh, heat-related uh, illnesses. Uh, and on to the next slide. We have training for each pesticide or similar group. Pesticide must cover environmental concerns such as drift or runoff. So of course you don't want to spray a, a school bus that's passing by because that can be a problem and essentially uh, kids can be exposed to that. Um, field posting requirements. Uh, such as skull and crossbone um, postings on all four corners of the field, uh, just making sure or, you know, announcing that uh, nobody would, would enter that field specifically. It'll also provide uh, pesticide name. It'll uh, provide application, uh, what, is ap what is being applied day and uh, start and end time. Uh, potential hazards to children and pregnant women. So uh, pesticide residues that are taken home, or if any contaminated clothing that is taken home and essentially uh, exposing children or pregnant women at home that can cause an accident also or signs or symptoms. Um, how to report suspected pesticide use violations. Um, you can always report back to your A8s or A9s, uh, which will provide uh, employee, employee rights to know and employee rights uh, to report an accident or report a suspected use violation. Or you can always call your county um, at commissioner's office, and they will provide information on uh, what to do, how to do, um, and therefore. Uh, and then other employees' rights. Other employees' rights can be receiving information in the language that they know, uh, such as receiving information um, in the language that they speak off of the SDS. It could be a label. It could be application specifics. All employees have a right to know um, this type of information in the language that they do speak or that they do know. Okay. On to the next slide. So emergency medical care for employees handling pesticides must be planned in advance. So you do have to have uh, certain procedures. You do have to have your emergency uh, information provided prior to making an application. 
Um, again, once again, it does have to be posted on tractors and with the actual applicator anytime there is an application being made. Um, inform the employees of the name, phone number, and location of the emergency medical care facility. And that is also posted on the A8s that we had went over on the second slide. Um, it does provide the, the uh, name, the address, and the phone number for the medical facility that uh, your employer is using. And post the information at a central or a prominent location and provide a copy of the material safety data sheet for any possible exposure uh, during an application. Anytime there's an exposure, the, the employee that is making the application must have a uh, must have the SDS or the label with them. That way they, they could uh, give all the information to any physician, doctor, et cetera. So the next slide, here's an example of emergency uh, information that you can have posted on your tractor or with your employee. So at the top, it, it does explain uh, name, location, telephone number, uh, health and safety representative. You could list um, all your health and safety representatives also. Uh, first aid equipment, you could put the location or where it is accessible. Emergency services, you could put your emergency services name, location, and telephone number. Emergency assembly point. This emergency assembly point does have to be uh, verbally uh, explained to everybody and also on the actual uh, information tag or uh, sticker that you guys have posted on the tractor, but it does have to be accessible for all employees. Uh, local hospital, once again, you could access that to your A8s, but because you, you are spraying inside the field and you, you're not at the central location all the time, uh, these do have to be provided and they do have to be uh, filled out with your local hospital and, uh, or physician that you guys may be using. And accident report uh, logbook. Uh, logbook, it could be on here. Um, you, could, you could put the location of your logbook, whether it's in your office or at your shop. Uh, once again, it does have to be accessible for all employees. That way they do know where to report and how to report um, in their logbooks. Uh, so for the next slide, uh, handler decontamination. So ensure sufficient water, soap, and single-use paper towels uh, for routine washing. So this is in case of an exposure um, and for say you're in the middle of the field and uh, an accident were to happen, you're, you're using a uh, open tractor, pesticides land right directly inside your eyes uh, you do have to have uh, water, soap, and single-use paper towels to help decontaminate. Um, it does have to be stored in a chemical-resistant container, and it must be within a quarter-mile distance or on the actual uh, applicator. So you could have it inside your tractor. You could uh, mount it on your tractor. It does have to be airtight, and it does have to prevent uh, contamination. Also, you do have to ensure sufficient water for emergency eye flushing and uh, washing of the entire body. So if you do, if you do not have eye wash stations or decontamination stations, uh, depending on, of course, your county, wherever you are in, a water hose is sufficient. You could thoroughly wash out your, your entire body. You could wash your eyes. Uh, but you do need to have proper decontamination procedures, such as, uh, you know, eye wash, eye, eye wash uh, well, flushing your eyes. Um, just to avoid more contamination to your other eyes. So you do have to assure that you are explaining this to your employees. Uh, you also have to assure that the water is in good quality and temperature. So if it's too cold, it may react differently with uh, pesticides within the body. Um, and, you know, essentially it could be an even more worse uh, accident. Uh, one clean change of coveralls must be available. Um, that also does have to be in your decontamination kit. Um, uh, glasses, extra uh, protective eyewear, uh, gloves, um, all PPE does have to be provided by the employer and it does have to be inside the decontamination uh, kit. Uh, and more requirements for uh, commercial applicators depending on where you are making your application and your counties um, that you are in. So for the next slide, here we have an example of a mixer that has all his PPE with him. So in case of an accident, um, and essentially he's exposed or his coverall is uh, contaminated, his gloves are too contaminated to be, be able to use or they rip or so forth. The decontamination de kit does have to be at the mix and load site for these purposes. Uh, they ha do have to have an extra change of clothes um, in case there is an exposure, in case there is an accident or uh, they are uh, contaminated with the pesticide that they are mixing. They have to be able to 
take their, their PPE off and put new PPE on. That way there's no more exposure anywhere else. And on to the next slide, personal protective equipment. So employers shall provide all PPE required by the uh, pesticide product label. So if your pesticide product label requires gloves, glasses, protective eyewear, I'm sorry, um, gloves, uh, respirator, anything that is PPE, it does have to be provided by your employer. Uh, you do have to provide for its proper storage and daily inspection and cleaning. Uh, so proper storage being a airtight or a chemical resistant container. Um, that way you can store all your PPE in there. And it does have to be separate than where you store your pesticides. Um, whether it's a C train that you have that you store your pesticides in, you cannot store your PPE inside uh, that particular C train where all your uh, pesticides are at. Uh, repair and uh, replace any damaged PPE. So make sure if you are a grower or an employer uh, that you do explain to your employees that anytime you do have to repair or replace PPE, that it must be done immediately. Um, your county, your county ad commissioner does not want to see your applicators out with coveralls that have holes all over them or that, you know, you're using the wrong type of gloves or anything like that. Make sure you, your employees or you, if you're a grower or an, um, a grower or an employer, you do explain these things to your employees also. Uh, and ensure that PPE is used correctly for its intended purpose. So, Again, if, if you are spraying pesticides, all everything that is required by the label, it does have to be worn. The label is a law, um, it's a federal law, and it, it does have to be worn. So if for say glasses, so a, a misuse on the glasses is always, if the, if the label requires a respirator and eye protection, a lot of people tend to put their glasses on top of their hat or on top of their head because the respirator makes their glasses fog up. And that is a misuse of your, uh, of your PPE. And essentially if, if a county inspector were to come out or DPR were to come out or um, an accident happens, the employee will be responsible for, for that action because he is, he is misusing your, his proper PPE. Um, so if you are an employer or a grower, you do have to explain the proper use of the PPE, you do have to label train all employees on how to uh, personally receive all the information on the PPE. Um, or if they, they cannot read, if they're Spanish speakers and they cannot read in English, um, then you, uh, each employer does have to have a person designated for that uh, specific type of job to translate the information that the employee does need. So on to the next slide. Personal protective equipment employees, um, must wear chemical resistant gloves when mixing, loading, or applying pesticides or when exposed uh, to application equipment. The gloves must be 14 mils or thicker. Uh, the 14 mil gloves, a lot of people tend to refer uh, to them as the green gloves. Um, and also uh, 14 mil, there's, there is a test to the 14 mil gloves. If you could stick a pencil and penetrate through the glove, um, it most likely is not 14 mils. If, if the pencil could go straight through the glove, it is most, most likely not 14 mils. Um, so it does have to be 14 mils or thicker in order to be able to spray uh, liquid pesticides. Uh, flock gloves or those with any other, um, any other type of non-separable liners are prohibited. Uh, gloves used to make fine adjustments to equipment or other activities that require high uh, dexterity must be made of an uh, appropriate burial material and gloves must be appropriately chemical resistant material. So if, you, if your gloves do not meet these standards, um, they're, they're, some labels are, are uh, PPE specific. Um, it might require different types of gloves, but this is the minimum. Uh, 14 mils is the minimum. It has to be thicker. And if they don't meet these requirements, then you must uh, go purchase uh, 14 mil uh, gloves or anything thicker than that. And here's a, an example of the gloves. So on, on the left image that you see here, it does show leather. Um, leather is not allowed because it's, it's an absorbent um, and so is fabric. Um, and essentially it can penetrate through and access the skin and an exposure can happen. Um, and it does say uh, choose chemical resistant gloves because essentially, you know, it'll resist the chemical from penetrating into the um, skin or touching the skin. 
Um, and then there's two different examples on how to use your gloves. On the right hand side, um, you see a glove worn by an employee with uh, his uh, shirt sleeve over the glove. So this just depends on the type of application that you are uh, making. So if it's a ground application and you're using a wand or you're using or you're holding the, the actual application uh, material, then you do have to have your, your glove over your sleeve. Now, if you're not holding anything, if you're not holding the, the equipment, uh, then the sleeve could essentially go over the, the, uh, the glove and it'll give it a little bit more protection in that case. So on to the next slide. Personal protective equipment employees must wear chemical resistant footwear or chemical resistant foot coverings when required. So once again, PPE on the label is uh, PPE, I'm sorry, uh, the label is PPE specific on each label and we'll be going over some PPE and label um, explanations in here shortly. Um, it will be PPE specific. So anytime chemical resistant gloves, or uh, you know, uh, chemical resistant uh, footwear is required, it will explain it on the label. So once again, this is why it is very important that the employers go over the PPE label in the language that um, the employees speak, because if they essentially cannot read the label, they will not know when uh, chemical footwear, chemical resistant footwear is required. Um, and on to the next slide. Uh, Personal protective equipment employees must uh, wear chemical resistant apron that covers the front of the body for mid chest to the knees when required. So this uh, chemical resistant apron is mostly for mixers and loaders. And when anytime it is required on the label, once again, it might be, uh, well, each label is PPE specific. Um, and whenever it is required, it may not, it may be separated on the label for mixers and loaders. Uh, mixers and loaders might have a separate section on the actual label uh, where it does explain their PPE that is required for them. And this is essentially where you'll find where it requires the chemical resistant apron, uh, chemical resistant footwear. Um, it may, you know, mixers and loaders may, uh, it may, each label may require mixers and loaders to have more PPE rather than the actual applicators. Um, and once again, if the label requires it, it is a law and you do have to be using it. So on to the next slide. Uh, wear a chemical resistant suit that covers the torso, head, arms, and legs when the full body suit is required. So anytime a label says coveralls, uh, this is what they mean. And anytime you are using an open tractor and uh, coveralls are required, um, and you're making an overhead application for say you're spraying your, the actual tree, um, you do have to have head protection. And on the right, on the right uh, coverall that you see here, it does provide um, overhead protection. Um, now, whenever it is required to have overhead protection, um, you could also use a, a face shield or goggles because essentially uh, pesticides will be landing from above the head. And now uh, PPE and heat illness, um, if the ambient temperature exceeds 80 degrees during daylight hours or 85 degrees during nighttime hours, uh, employees must, uh, employees required to wear a chemical resistance suit per the pesticide label must not handle these pesticides unless the pesticide is being handled uh, pursuant to a list of exemptions found in the regulation or employees use cold chemical resistant suits or the uh, employer provides engineering controls that effectively reduce the temperature to an effective working environment. So this is a great example of why heat illness uh, trainings are extremely important, especially um, during, during applications. Um, high heat temperatures, uh, PPE, um, plastic PPE, chemical resistant PPE, uh, this essentially could cause, you know, heat onto the body and could possibly also show signs of symptoms of a heat stroke or, or any heat related um, illness. So this is why it is very important to have procedures on heat illness during an application and also provide or attempt to provide uh, engineering controls that effectively reduce the temperatures to an effective working environment, such as in closed cabs or closed tra uh, tractors that do have air ventilation, they do have AC, um, and it does avoid any heat related illness and uh, so forth. So next, uh, wear protective eyewear when mixing, loading, and applying pesticides uh, by hand or ground rig. 
and when exposed to application mixing or loading equipment that contains or contaminated with pesticides. So whenever you're wearing protective eyewear, uh, this protective eyewear does have to meet certain requirements. It does have to have brow coverage and side, uh, side eye coverage. Um, and on, the, on this next slide, if, if we could go to the next slide, it does, it, I will explain it a bit more. So appropriate protective eyewear must provide brow and temple uh, protection. That confirms to the uh, curvature of the face and side protection of the eye. So if you do have sunglasses, if you uh, have reading glasses or eyeglasses, um, those are not sufficient because they do not provide uh, the brow coverage or the side coverage and they do not uh, curve along with the face. It does have to have a curve to it that, that curves along with the face and it does have to have the brow and temple protection, which is from the side and above the eyebrow. If the pesticide label requires uh, eyewear to be worn, but does not identify the specific type of protection device must, um, does not specify the type of protective eyewear, the protective device must meet compliance standards specific to the American National Standard of Occupational and Education um, Personal Eye and Face Protection Device Code and can be safety glasses that provide front, brow, and temple protection, goggles, or face shield. Now there's an alternative to this. So if you do have eyeglasses for say, you have reading glasses that, that you cannot see uh, without, you can wear them, but you do have to meet the standards and you do have to find a way to, to uh, you know, again, meet the standards. So if you do wear those, those glasses, I would recommend wearing a face shield. That way it does not, you know, fog up your glasses. It doesn't, you know, you can still see and you do have, you know, breathing, uh, a lot more um, easier breathing rather than wearing a full face respirator that does provide eye protection also. So uh, yeah, so make, making sure that your glasses do meet these standards, it does have to have the brow coverage, the side coverage of the eye. Um, and if you, if you do wear glasses that you cannot see without, um, goggles or face shields should, should be uh, sufficient enough in that case. So regulations upon uh, PPE exemptions. So the regulations allow for some exemptions and substitutions for PPE required by the uh, product labeling. However, employees should assure that all exempt PPE is present and available for use at the work site and stored in a chemical resistant container. So if there is any exemptions for the type of application that you're making um, based off of the PPE, I'm sorry, for the PPE that you're using based off of the application that you're making, um, it does have to be provided and it does have to be present at the actual location of the application. Um, and it does have to be provided by the employer. employer employ, the employers do have to, um, again, they do have to provide all PPE for the employees. So chemical resistant gloves and protective eyewear are not required when uh, applying pesticides in an enclosed cab. So anytime you are inside an enclosed cab and it does have the filtration working perfectly fine, it is enclosed. Uh, so essentially there's no, not much exposure. Uh, your chemical resistant gloves and your protective eyewear are not required inside an enclosed cab. Now, uh, using vehicle mounted or towed equipment with spray nozzles that are located below the employee and are directed downward, your chemical resistant gloves and your protective eyewear are once again not required because it is below and um, underneath the actual applicator and essentially there's no exposure um, because it is not above the actual applicator. Uh, applying vertebrae pesticide control baits using long-handed uh, implements that provide actual, um, that avoid actual hand contact with the bait. Uh, so, it, you know, if, if you're not actually making direct contact with the bait or, you know, your control baits or anything like that, uh, essentially your chemical resistant gloves and your protective eyewear are not required also. Uh, working in situations where the handlers um, has no liquid contact with the fumigant. So if, you, if you're not spraying liquid pesticides, your chemical resistant gloves, your protective eyewear are not required um, in that situation or in that certain type of application. Uh, using an application system approved by the state that is engineered to provide a level of protection that is equivalent to a better or um, better than the required PPE that is required on the label. Uh, protective eyewear is not required when, so this is uh, specific to protective eyewear only. Um, it is not talking about chemical resistant gloves or coveralls or anything like that. 
This is uh, protective eyewear. Um, protective eyewear is not required when applying non uh, ins insected insecticidal, I'm sorry, uh, lures or baiting insects, uh, monitoring traps. So if you're a trap checker and there's no, essentially no exposure to this, your protective eyewear is not required. Uh, applying a solid fumigant such as aluminum phosphide, magnesium phosphide, and smoke cartridges to vertebrate burrows, your protective eyewear is also not required then. Um, and applying vertebrate uh, pesticide control um, baits that are placed with being propelled from application equipment, your protective eyewear is also not required in this situation. So protective eyewear, coveralls, chemical resistant gloves, and chemical resistant apron may be worn instead of PPE required by the uh, pesticide product labeling when using a closed mixing system to handle pesticide products with a signal word of danger or warning. So if you are using a closed, uh, enclosed mixing system, um, you could always use your eyewear coveralls, chemical resistant gloves and chemical resistant apron instead of using what the label requires. So if the label requires a respirator, chemical resistant uh, footwear, anything like that, um, it is not mandatory to be using. Um, you could always use your alternative uh, PPE such as protective eyewear coveralls, chemical resistant gloves and chemical resistant apron um, once again, instead of using what the, P, uh, the PPE that the label actually requires when you are uh, essentially mixing a danger or warning product. Uh, this also applies when using a closed mixing system to handle dry pesticide product formulation provided. Um, they are packaged in a sealed and intact water soluble packet. So this water soluble packet, whenever mixing or loading, um, you do not have to open. These, these packets never have to be open. Uh, you can just place them inside the engineering controls um, and it should mix on its own. Um, this, this PPE is required whenever using uh, water soluble packets, uh, your protective eyewear coveralls, chemical resistant gloves and chemical resistant apron, um, once again, can be used whenever making this type of mix. Uh, protective eyewear and work clothing may be worn instead of PPE required by pesticide product labeling when using closed uh, system to handle pesticide product with the signal word caution. So the signal word caution uh, essentially is the less the the lesser toxic of uh, all three signal words um, and you may be wondering what is a work clothing um, you know what what are the requirements or the limitations of work clothing so work clothing consists of long sleeve shirt long pants shoes plus socks so that is what uh, counties or DPR requires uh, for all employees to use anytime there is an application that is the minimum um, anytime uh, eyewear is, is required or uh, chemical resistant gloves is required by the label, then you, you, you may have to use that or you do have to use it. But as far as protective eyewear and work clothing while using a closed mixing system that has a single word caution, um, these things do have to be worn anytime, again, whenever using this closed mixing system. So if a filtery, uh, filtering face piece respirator or dust mist, uh, mist filtering respirator is required by the pesticide product labeling, then no respirator is required to be worn inside the enclosed cab if the enclosed cab has a properly functioning air ventilation system. So a dust mist uh, filtering respirator is a NIOSH N95. Uh, these NIOSH N95s um, essentially are paper masks. A lot of people tend to confuse a dust mask with a respirator. A respirator such as a dust or mist, uh, mist um, respirator does have um, all the information on the actual respirator. So it will say NIOSH N95. It'll have two, uh, two tag, two, uh, I'm sorry, uh, two, two strands that go above the head and below the ears that wrap around the, the head. Um, and that's how you essentially um, could tell the difference between a, a dust mask and the actual respirator, a dust mist respirator. Um, and anytime you are applying pesticides that do require this type of respirator inside a enclosed cab, um, it is not mandatory inside the, the tractor. Um, if any other type of respirators is required by the pesticide labeling, then the respirators must be worn inside the enclosed cab during handling activity. So anytime uh, full face respirators required half face respirators required with the cartridges or canisters or so forth, um, 
these respirators do have to be worn inside the enclosed cab at the moment of the actual application. So uh, here's an example of a label. Uh, we'll be going over the signal word. I've mentioned the signal word a num number of times already. Um, so the signal word here is caution, being that uh, regalia is, is one of the lesser toxic uh, pesticides um, because it is a caution. Um, it may require less PPE um, if you are spraying inside an enclosed cab and for say regalia requires a dust or mist uh, respirator such as a NEOS N95 and you are spraying inside an enclosed cab, then your uh, respirator does not have to be worn or it is not mandatory to be worn inside an enclosed cab. Also on the actual label, um, on all labels, it'll provide first aid information. Uh, if swallowed, if landed on skin or clothing, if uh, inhaled or if it lands in your eyes, it does provide first aid um, in case you do need to provide first aid for any employee that um, essentially has been exposed to pesticides. So on to the next one. So here um, on the on agriculture use requirements, um, this portion of the label will have the REI restricted entry interval. Um, on this particular uh, label for regalia, the REI time is four hours. So anytime, anytime uh, an employee has to access or has to um, per, you know, perform any early entry uh, activities such as, you know, different types of jobs inside the, the field during these four hours. It'll have a list directly below where it says PPE required for early entry to treated areas that's permitted under the worker protection standard and that involves contact with any, anything that has been treated such as plants, soil, or water. And then it'll have a list of PPE um, that is required to perform these early entry activities such as coveralls, waterproof gloves, shoes plus socks, protective eyewear. And then at the very bottom, it, it does say exemptions. So if you read this, it'll say, if the product is soil injected or soil incorporated, the worker protection standard under certain circumstances allows workers to enter the treated area if there will be no contact with anything that has been treated. So if you have contact with anything that has been treated, this PPE is required. If you will not have any contact with the PPE, or I'm sorry, with the with uh, anything that has been treated, um, then essentially there's a, there is exemptions. Um, the last portion does say the REI does not apply when this product is used for a seed treatment at planting or in a hopper box treatments. So if we go on to the next slide, it does provide um, protective eyewear and gloves. Um, on the actual PPE that was required to uh, for the early entry access, um, it, I don't remember exactly if it did say uh, protective eyewear or gloves, but because of the worker protection standard does require anytime you are performing any type of uh, handling or handling pesticides, uh, protective eyewear and chemical resistant gloves uh, should be worn or provided to the employees to avoid uh, any type of exposure or any type of accident to happen. Um, during handling uh, pesticides. Another example of more PPE, this is an example of uh, the coveralls. The coveralls was uh, required by the label for any early entry uh, activities. Uh, this is a great example of a, of a coverall. These are single use. Um, anytime it is contaminated or if it has a hole or anything like that, it does have to be disposed properly and a it, it, uh, new set of coveralls must be um, given to the employee who's making these uh, pesticide or that is handling the pesticide. So another example of a label would be uh, Grandivo. So it is a caution. This is uh, one part of the label that is extremely important is the signal word identifying the toxicity once again. Um, right below it, it does say the first aid. Um, it does provide information if it lands in your eyes, if it is inhaled, if it is swallowed or if it lands on your skin or clothing. Um, and at the very bottom of this first aid, it does have a hotline number. So anytime an accident were to happen and you do have to call this hotline number, um, one of the questions that they do ask for is the actual EPA number. So the EPA number does have to be found um, on the label. And if you see where it says, uh, keep, uh, keep out of reach of children, Directly to the left of that, it does say EPA registration number. 
So this number belongs to this label. Uh, a great example of this number would be a social security number. So each person has a social security number, that number belongs to that specific person. Well, this number, this EPA number belongs to this specific label. Um, anytime you do call this hotline number and you provide this number, uh, this EPA number, uh, they will know exactly what product you are spraying, what the first aid requirements are, what the REI time is, uh, what type of pesticide it is, the active ingredient, it'll give them all the information that um, they can possibly need um, in that situation. So this EPA number is extremely important to locate uh, and explain to all employees, um, especially, you know, uh, foreign employees who don't speak the language that um, the label is presented to them. It does have to be explained in the language um, that they do understand. So uh, reading the PPE portion of the label. So this is what um, this is where you could find the actual PPE. So if you see where it says personal protective equipment, PPE, and it does say applicators and other handlers must wear long sleeve shirt and long pants, waterproof gloves, shoes plus socks and protective eyewear. Um, and directly below it, it does say mixers and loaders um, and applicators must wear a dust mist uh, filtering respirator, meaning NEOS standards. Again, it could be an N95, R95, or a P95. And repeated uh, exposures to high concentrated of microbial uh, proteins can cause allergic sens uh, sensitizations. So anytime you do feel um, any exposure or any uh, symptoms of an exposure, it is very important that each employee does uh, report these things immediately. Um, also, at the very top of this label, it does say uh, it does have caution. It does it, it does say caution, and it does explain a couple things. And I will read it to you guys. Um, it does cause moderate eye irritation. Avoid uh, contact with the eyes or clothing. Wear goggles and safety glasses. Wash thoroughly with soap and water after handling and before eating, drinking, chewing gum, using tobacco, or using the toilet. Uh, and remove washed uh, contaminated clothing before use. So anytime. You do have you are handling pesticides. Make sure you guys are continuously washing your hands before eating, drinking, uh, chewing gum, using tobacco, etc., uh, to avoid any cross contamination from the actual um, pesticide equipment that you guys use or the, the pesticide container. Um, you know, in essentially going um, towards the employee. Um, remove contaminated clothing before use. So uh, remove and wash. I'm sorry. Uh, Pesticide, uh, PPE, anytime it is, there is an exposure, anytime it is contaminated with the actual uh, pesticide, it must be uh, removed directly and it does have to be uh, thoroughly washed and decontaminated um, to avoid any more exposures to anybody else that may come in contact with that PPE that should be um, disposed. Now going on to this next slide, uh, another, another example of the uh, protective eyewear that was required by the label. Um, and the chemical resistant gloves that, again, must be 14 mils or thicker. Um, if you do have any questions on the 14 mils or thicker, you can always call your county agriculture uh, commissioner and they will provide information such as uh, what type of chemical resistant gloves are required by the label. And then here, um, because the label didn't uh, mention coveralls or uh, any in full body protection, this is what the standard uh, means. So a long sleeve shirt, long pants, chemical resistant gloves, uh, shoes plus socks. Now we cannot see his socks, but because the label requires it and the label is a law, he does have to be wearing his socks um, and his uh, closed toed shoes. Um, he, now uh, respiratory protection. Um, employees must use a, a approved respiratory equipment in compliance with the state regulations when handling pesticides where respirators are required by the label, restricted material permit conditions or regulations. Uh, the employer shall establish a written respiratory uh, protection program with worksite specific procedures, such as uh, storage, uh, decontamination of the actual respirator, et cetera, just to avoid any exposure uh, to any type of pesticide. And a voluntary, uh, voluntary respiratory program may provide respirators at the request of the employees or permit uh, employees to their own respirators to use on a voluntary basis. So um, again, you know, res if respirators are not required by the label and an employee wants to use a respirator for more protection, voluntarily they can use um, that type of respirator during the, ap during the application. 
So respiratory protection, the written uh, respiratory protection program should include procedures for selecting a certain type of respirator. It does have to fit properly. It does have to fit the shape of the face and it does have to be there's a certain size, um, again, to, to fit the actual face. Uh, medical evaluations for employees. So these medical evaluations essentially make sure that the employee is in condition to be able to use a respirator, uh, making sure that they don't have any uh, respiratory problems or anything like that, just making sure that they are in condition to be able to use a respirator. Uh, fit testing procedures must be provided by the employer. Uh, fit testing procedures such as um, how to properly use a respirator, uh, you know, sour tasting, or uh, making sure that nothing could essentially get inside the actual respirator. Um, because if, you know, if it's loose fitting or if you have a beard, you're not clean shaved and something could essentially enter the respirator, that just means that uh, pesticides will easily uh, get into the, to the actual respirator. Uh, procedures for scheduling, cleaning, storing, inspecting and repairing and other um, maintaining respirators. So cleaning and inspection is a must anytime uh, a respirator will be used or is, has just been used. Cleaning and inspecting is a mandatory. Uh, storing is extremely important. Um, the reason why is because we don't, uh, essentially the employer doesn't want the uh, employees to uh, mix their respirators and essentially use another employee's respirator. Uh, especially with COVID going on, we don't want anybody getting sick. Uh, but the storing, you do have to place them in a plastic bag, a sealable bag, chemical resistant bag. Um, and it does, it does have to have the employee's name written on it, again, just to, um, to avoid any uh, mix up with the respirators and grabbing another employee's respirator in that case. Uh, training for employees and the proper use of the respirators. Once again, that's part of the fit test, the shape of the face, how to properly put it on, um, how to properly store it, et cetera. Um, also training in the, in the respiratory hazard that are potentially exposed during the uh, routine and emergency uh, situations. So again, you, uh, emergency, uh, emergency procedures are required um, along with the respiratory protection um, uh, program, and it does have to be accessible for the employees also. And here are two different types of respirators. These are not dust or mist uh, respirators. The, this, the respirator on the left-hand side um, is a 3M NIOSH approved. Once again, it's a half face respirator. Um, these resp this particular respirator does have to be um, fit tested and it does, it does have to be, well, each employee has to be trained on how to properly use this respirator. Um, on the right hand side, we do have a full face respirator. Um, again, this one does have to be uh, fit tested also. Um, and if one certain employee wears these, both of these types of respirators, he, he then has to be um, fit tested for both of them. Um, if he fit tests for just one, uh, essentially he's not allowed to, to wear another until he's, he's uh, fit tested for that particular respirator that he will be using. And on to the next side, um, pesticide toxicity classifications, uh, toxicity and the capacity of the chemical to cause harm to, the, to your health. Um, EPA has designated the signal word to help indicate the user and the pesticide product toxicity level. And the toxicity level is determined by the ac acute short-term toxicity data of the pesticide product toxicity uh, to humans. So if we go to this next slide, it'll explain um, the different types of signal words and um, the meaning behind them. So caution being the least uh, toxic or you know, the least of all of them, uh, does explain slightly toxic either orally, dermally, or through inhalation, causes slight eye or skin irritation, rather than a warning, which is in the middle, uh, moderately toxic either orally, dermally, or through inhalation causes moderate eye or skin irritation. Uh, danger being one of the highest can cause severe eye damage or skin irritation, and highly toxic by, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Danger poison is highly toxic by any route of the, um, by any entry route of the body. Okay, so if we go to this next slide, it'll have another explanation on the signal words. Um, category one would be the highest toxicity. If you see on the far right, it'll have a skull and crossbone. It'll say danger. Um, anytime a skull and crossbone is presented on the actual label, 
it is uh, poison. Um, and that basically just means that, you know, it's, it's a deadly uh, pesticide. Uh, category two would be a warning, which would be right down the middle. Um, and category three would be a caution, which would be the least tox uh, toxic. And then uh, category uh, four would be the lowest toxicity. And if, we, if you see the table on the right-hand side, it'll say uh, the signal word, danger, warning, caution, uh, toxicity rating, highest toxicity or highly corrosive. Um, and a few drops to one teaspoon can essentially be lethal, uh, a lethal dose to a person that is essentially 160 pounds. Uh, a warning, moderately toxic, one teaspoon to uh, one tablespoon of this certain type of product that, or a warning product can be lethal can be a lethal dose to a person that weighs 160 pounds. Um, and a caution, which is the least toxic, uh, is lethal to, to a person that weighs 160, 160 pounds um, with one tablespoon to a pint or greater. Now, if we go to this next slide, we have examples of the uh, labels. So used to designate the lowest level of the human toxicity, regalia and uh, grandivo. Um, are both cautions and they do uh, are they are the lowest and um, yeah so so basically these are the lowest toxic toxicity of the the um, signal words and if we go to the next slide it'll provide so it'll it'll say the signal word warning which would be the the and right down the middle and if you go to the next the signal word danger uh, essentially being the highest um, can be more lethal to a person weighing 160 pounds. Now, if we go to the next slide, again, once again, uh, the signal word danger can cause severe eye damage or skin irritation, not highly toxic uh, if inhaled or swallowed. Uh, precautionary statements uh, hazard to, me, to humans and uh, domestic animals uh, could cause irreversible eye damage. Um, next slide. The signal word danger poison, once again, these may be restricted use pesticides and it is the highest tier of toxicity on the um, signal words that are provided on the actual label. So if we go moving on to uh, closed mixing system requirements, closed mixing systems are engineering controls used to protect workers from uh, dermal hazards when mixing pesticides with high acute uh, dermal toxicity, acute meaning um, short term, uh, the employee shall assure, uh, the employer shall assure employees use an appropriate closed mixing system when such a system is specified by the uh, pesticide product label and that's, and the specific type of closed mixing system will be provided on the label. So if we do go to the next slide, uh, it does provide uh, an example of a closed mixing system and the PPE um, that the employee should be wearing. So chemical resistant gloves, um, and the type of, of course, the, the closed mixing system that is being used. So if we go to the next slide now, um, closed mixing system requirements, all PPE that is required by the uh, pesticide label must be at the work site during operation of the closed mixing system and available in the condition that provides the intended protection. Uh, protective eyewear must be worn while using a closed mixing system and all employees operating any uh, such systems shall be trained on how to properly operate the system prior to uh, using the actual closed system. So if we go to the next slide, uh, the tier one system can uh, are required for any liquid pesticide or adjuvant uh, product bearing the statement fatal if absorbed through skin. Uh, tier one system must be capable of enclosing the pesticide while removing uh, the, con the contents from the original container and preventing the pesticide from con uh, contacting handlers. And tier one system must be able to rinse drain that um, the empty container as required by the product label while being connected to the closed mixing system. It, this this uh, specific type of closed mixing system will rinse um, and it'll essentially clean the container um, before removing it. So on to the next slide. It does provide uh, information or an example on a tier one closed mixing system. Um, an example of an employee using it, uh, the penetration through the cap and then the PPE that is required to use 
a tier one uh, closed mixing system. And on to the next slide. So a tier two closed mixing system um, are those who mix liquid pesticides, not including adjuvants, bearing the statement may be fatal if absorbed through skin or corrosive causes skin damage or um, other capable language. A tier two uh, system must be capable of enclosing the pesticide while removing the uh, contents from the original container and preventing the pesticide from contact uh, from contacting the actual handler. And if you do have any questions, um, drop them in the Q and A. And Angela, back to wonderful. You. Thank you so much, David. A wealth of information there, and of course, very important information for a variety of reasons. For those of you that are on the webinar, thank you so much for staying for the entire two hours. We have a pretty captive audience here. Um, and we just wanna make sure there aren't any questions uh, for David. So if you have a question, please make sure to post it in the Q&A section. I'm checking chat just to make sure. We'll just give a, a couple of seconds here to see if anybody else has has a question for David. Um, while we wait to, to make sure there aren't any questions, I just remind you that we did record this webinar and I will be sending out a copy of this presentation in PDF form, as well as a link to the recording. So you're welcome to watch it at any time. Um, if you come across you know, months down the road and you're like, hey, I wanna revisit that and, and you can't find the email in your <laughs> inbox, um, I will also be making a webinar page on our website where we'll host, where we'll place all of these webinars. Um, so you know, if down the road you, you wanna reference back to it um, and it hasn't been more than a year, please feel free to visit our website um, or you can contact us through our website and I'd be happy to send you an updated link. For those of you that are attending the webinar for credits, we do have two credits available for this webinar. Uh, please make sure to keep a copy of the presentation on file. It has the course code. And um, I will be sending out in the follow-up email, not only the link to the presentation and the recording, but also a link to a, a, a quiz that you need to complete in order to receive your DPR credit. That quiz is through SurveyMonkey. It's 10 simple questions. You have to have a 70% or greater pass rate. And in that quiz, you're going to have to put your PCA number. We're gonna reference your PCA number and your name to the attendance for today. And that will be our record that we'll, we will keep on hand should DPR ever audit us. I would encourage you, I will follow up with you and let you know what your pass rate was. So you have everything um, on hand and you just need to save it on your files as well, in your files as well, in case you're audited. So hopefully that clarifies any questions about that. Um, we, we have, I think we're good here. We don't have any questions in the Q&A. So with that, I'm gonna thank you one final time for attending our webinar. And a uh, special thanks to our speakers, Brian Guest, Dr. Melissa O'Neill, and David Gomez. Thank you so much for your time and contributing your knowledge to this information. And for those of you that are interested, please stay tuned for additional webinars throughout November and December. This afternoon, we have one on organic production. So if you have not received information about that already, um, please feel free to message me and, uh, or send a, a note in the chat and I will make sure to uh, send you the information on the organic production webinar that we're having this afternoon. With that, thank you and have a great day.